Welcome to the Sooth Site podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Dole. This is part three of our three part interview with Dr. Anthony Scrifignano. If you haven't already watched the first two, where we focus on ensuring reliability and integrity, as well as the search for truth in data science, make sure to check those out. In this episode, we talk about building data science solutions that work on a global scale, how to find balance between standardization versus nuanced cases, the future of AI, common myths, and more with one of the world's preeminent data scientists. Regardless of your background, this is a highly informative conversation that deserves your attention. So I don't think I've met anyone who has worked with more international companies and governments than you. So when you're building data solutions that work on a global scale, how do you find balance between standardizing things like data governance or usability uh, of predictions versus incorporating regional nuances. Every you know geography will typically have different requirements. So, do I impose a structure or make regional accommodations every time? Uh, so, if you if you think of a pendulum and you think of that pendulum swinging from fully federated, you know everything. Everybody does what they want to do regionally to fully centralized, where there's one way and that's the one way, and it's the the one ring to rule them all. The we're gonna. Sorry, I said this is the way. Well, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do the maximum of all of those laws. You know, we're gonna comply with all the laws everywhere, all the time, even when it's not required in that place. Um, there are times when it makes a lot of sense to do the one. There are times when it makes a lot of sense to do the other. There is no one right way. What I would say is be where you are on purpose, and think about the implications of it. So. If you go fully federated, you lose the economies of scale, you lose the learning, you know, the captured institutional learning because everybody's reinventing everything. If you go full, you know, uh, centralized everything, it tends to be very bulky, very cumbersome. There's lots of, um, you, you get a, a kind of an average solution that nobody likes uh, because it's really just equally bad for everyone. But sometimes you have to do that because that's the only way you can be compliant. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd say you've got to pick. What I've done with my teams always is try to make sure that I have a bunch of people that don't look like me and don't think like me, that come from different parts of the world, that speak different languages, that grew up with different experiences. I, yeah, I care what your degrees are, but I care more what you've done with the 20 or 30 years since then, right? Um, so it's important. Um, you know what you studied but it's also important what you've done with that knowledge a lot of people um get very impressed with you know pieces of paper and then you'll find out that that person that you're talking to has only played that one note on the piano you know over and over and over again and this other person is playing jazz uh if maybe what you need is that one note then that's the one person you want you know if you need a very specialized surgery you probably want the one that's done that over and over and over again if you are doing art you know maybe you want somebody that can paint with more than one color so it's not one answer it's about choosing where you are in that continuum purposefully and then being true to that choice if it's for regulatory reasons if it's for serving your customers if it's for delighting your your employees you know you, you might pull yourself in one direction or another just do it on purpose if if we can take a step back, how do you see the field of data science evolving in the future? I think data science practitioners are becoming more and more clinical. It used to be that you could understand everything there was to understand about a system. You could do all the math. You could see all the data. Those days are long gone. So we have to sort of form a differential diagnosis of what we think is going on and then go in and interact with these very complex systems, test our theories. And then, you know, come up with a treatment plan, if you will, or, or you know, figure out how we're going to make things better. Um, it's a different kind of skills. We used to need data scientists that were very good at wrangling data out of systems and, you know, uh, doing lots of, a lot of people rebranded themselves as data scientists, but didn't learn any data science. They were really good at modeling or they were really good at um, data architecture. They're really good at, at um, data extraction, transformation. All of those things are very important. So is storytelling, so is visualization, so is 
data governance and compliance. So is um, understanding AI ethics. So the skills that we needed are not this or that, they're this and that. And it's not likely you're gonna find people that have that variety of skills unless they've been doing this for a very long time. So you have to look across your team and make sure you have all of that somewhere on your team and that those voices are being heard and they're not being marginalized. Not an easy thing to do, especially in the world today where you know you, you get a job in data science and very often you're you're working on a picture that's so complex that you couldn't understand the big picture. You, you're you're modeling something maybe, and you don't understand how that model is being used, or you're being used to um, do something with. Uh, we talk about these language models, right? Can you can you make this thing more conversational? Work on the user, you know, experience of of this or that. But for what? Well, it's it's an email application. What's it doing? I don't know. Right? Um, there's a lot of that a lot of compartmentalizing. I'm often asked if if data science is becoming sort of an old enough term that we should stop using it. Like everybody has these skills. Anybody can get a bunch of open source code. You can learn Python in a weekend if you really put your mind to it. So is this really just a lot of hoopla? No, not if you think about the science part of the data science. The, the, the skills, the techniques, anybody can learn how to make a visualization. Some people are better at it than others. I've seen, you know, death by pie chart, right? Um, but, you know, that those are teachable skills. The thinking, the critical thinking, the, the ability to collaborate with other people, the nuance of understanding regionalization, of understanding how this might be interpreted. Those are really difficult skills, and we better be teaching those in our programs as well, veracity, you know, problem formulation, not just, you know, Python and R and, and, and all that technical stuff, also important. Yeah, it's, it's very dangerous without all of the aspects. What, if any, are there, are there any common myths that you want to dispel regarding you know, what's actually possible with data analytics, science, AI, machine learning, et cetera? Um, yeah, I mean, lots. And one of the big ones is, is um, Everything is in an AI ML problem, right? You, you can't just throw the data into a model when disruption is happening, for example. So we should be very weary of situations where the world is changing faster than the data that describes it, because you're not going to AI your way out of that, right? Um, we should be very careful. Um, this more data is always better attitude, not so much. Um, more and more we're learning that all of those sources of bias that I just talked about, you start adding more data, you start adding more noise. Uh, so you have to make sure you have the right data. There's a um, another myth that uh, as soon as something works, get it out there, you know, fail fast, right? I like to say fail fast, but differently. So it's important to get things out in the market. You don't have to make them perfect. But it doesn't mean that you don't have captured learnings. It doesn't mean that you don't do regression testing. You know, some of these things still have to happen. And sometimes we can become so, I'm, not, I'm trying very hard not to say the word agile, because then I get a whole bunch of people upset with me, but you can become so, so, um, so rapid in your deployment that you miss the basic blocking and tackling of making sure that you didn't break something that used to work while you're making something work in a different way, for example. Uh, so, you know, some of those common myths are hurry up and fail fast. I would say fail fast differently. More data is better. I would say sometimes you have to defend the data that you're using. And you can AI your way out of everything. No, absolutely not. And I don't think that day's ever going to come. What advice would you give to both people entering the field and to leaders of data and analytics organizations? So I'll do uh, the entering the field first. Um, for people entering the field, I would say um, don't only focus on the technical skills. Don't only focus on what you need to be able to put the alphabet soup in your resume. Here's all the languages I've learned. Here's all the systems I've worked on. Make sure you take the time to understand sampling methods, problem formulation, ethics, um, responsibility, explainability, all of these sort of softer skills. Day, uh, storytelling, you know, how you make things relevant, so important. If you want to be really good in this field, 
and be really good in the things that are the quote unquote softer skills as well. Uh, the second piece of advice I would give to anybody entering the field is probably, depending on what school you're in and what program you're in, you've been given a lot of data that contained the answer and data that you were allowed to use. And the real world isn't like that. The data doesn't always contain the answer and not all data is permissible. So be very careful that you don't think you're Superman just because you got, you know, a four Oh, average and you know all the stuff you did was awesome that stuff you did was designed to be done in a semester and real life doesn't work in semesters um and then the third thing i would say for the students is um and and you hit on this that um the more you can surround yourself with people you disagree with in the workplace it doesn't mean you have to fight with everybody but it does mean you have to listen to them so Try to find people that don't agree with you and make them challenge what you think is right and what you think you're going to do. And if you can't defend it, maybe you don't understand it, or maybe you're not as right as you think you are. For the leaders, I would say the most important thing is that we have to remember as leaders, I used to say it's amazing how smart people get when they get promoted, right? Um, you know, the skills that made you successful so far are not necessarily the skills that will make you successful going forward. So this idea of continuous learning, continuously improving your organization, don't just think about who do we need to hire, what skills do we need to bring onto the team? Think about the team that's there and how you're bringing them forward with these new capabilities. The second thing I would say for the leaders is to be humble that very often these very big complex problems can't be solved within the four walls of your organization. So think about who you collaborate with and, and trust those relationships and cherish those relationships. Find others that you can work with where, where you, together you can do things that separately neither of you can do. And those are incredibly powerful collaborations. There is no credible argument that the big problems that we're facing in this world right now can be solved with very small you know, push this button kind of solutions. And then the third thing, because there should always be three, the third thing for the leaders, I would say, is to constantly pick your head up and look around and see how the situation is changing. Because you, you, you know, we, we build plans, we have budgets, we have cycles, and we say, this is what we're going to do. There's our goals for the year. Here's our goals for the quarter. And then something changes and huge opportunities or huge risks come about. But we're so busy being on the mission that we don't notice them until maybe that opportunity is gone or maybe that problem got a lot bigger. So pick your head up once in a while, look around and make sure that things haven't changed while you were so busy working. Anthony, thank you so much. This has been an extremely insightful conversation. Hope thank we can do for, it again. It's always a joy talking to you, thank you. Likewise, my friend. Thank you for sticking around. This was an exceptionally interesting conversation and I very much appreciate how much time Dr. Scrifignano spent with me. Make sure to tune in to the next episode where I sit down with the legendary insurance and finance CIO, John Kish. If you would like to learn more about how Soothsayer can benefit your business, please check us out at soothsayeranalytics.com. You can also contact me directly at chris at soothsayeranalytics.com or find me at linkedin.com slash in slash cdol. Thank <music> you.